All right, so we are going to continue now with our investigation of the fundamental theorem of calculus, and this time we're looking at the second half of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so let's start out by reminding ourselves what does the second half say? Well, the second half says that if you have an antiderivative for a function and you're trying to evaluate the integral of that function, the integral from A to B, the definite integral, then all you got to do is take that antiderivative, plug in the right endpoint, take that antiderivative, plug in the left endpoint, and then calculate the difference between those two values, f of b minus f of a, that's going to give you the value for the definite integral. Um, there, there are a couple ways of proving this. Um, one option is, you know, so I, let me let me sketch a couple ways of doing it. One option for doing this is is using part one. Um, so I know that f prime of x equals f of x. So I suppose I've got this antiderivative. Um, and then if I say, hey, let's also define g of x to be the integral from a to b of f of t dt. And that means that g prime equals f of x as well. First part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that g prime is, is f of x. Um, so both of these functions have the same derivative. That means that um, f prime of x is g prime of x plus a constant. What's the constant? Well, um, note that or sorry, not f prime, f of x equals g of x plus c. Right? The derivatives are the same, so the functions have to differ by a constant. Um, we know that f of a would be g of a plus c. But what's g of a? g of a is the integral from a to a, a to a. Uh, if the two limits are the same, the integral is 0. So g of a is 0. So this is c. Okay. Um, therefore, f of x is equal to um, g of x plus f of a. So, g of x is f of x minus f of a. And, and this should hold for, oops, um, that should be an x up there, sorry guys. Um, that's going to hold for all values of x in particular that's going to hold when x equals b. So the integral from a to b, f of, well, it doesn't matter whether you use x or t, right? This is just some dummy variable of integration. The integral from a, a to b of f of t, 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 is g of b. But g of b is f of b minus f of a. Um, another way you can do it, is you can use uh, the mean value theorem. Um, yeah, we'll say just the mean value theorem. Um, OK. So what you can do is, is basically, um, you know, we think about how would we, how would we do this. So, so the integral from a to b of fx dx. Well, fx, you know, we have this antiderivative. So this is the integral from a to b of big F prime times dx, right? And we know that we would we would do this, uh, you know, we by definition we do the limit and going to infinity is this limit of Riemann sums, right? Uh, sum i going from 1 to n, uh, big F prime of some ci times delta x, right? And And now here's the thing on each one of these intervals, xi minus 1 to xi, um, we know from the mean value theorem that we can choose some ci so that f prime of ci is f of xi minus f of xi minus 1 over, well, what's the difference between the two endpoints? Over delta x, right? Or, or in other words, um, 
if we multiply both sides by delta x, f prime of ci times delta x, we can make sure that that is going to be f of xi minus f of xi minus 1. You can set it up like that. And if you think about what happens when you start writing out this sum, right, when when i equals 1, you get, let me kind of put it up here, you, when i equals 1, you get f of x1 minus f of x0, but f of x0 is a. And then you do i equals 2, and you get f of x2 minus f of x1, right? And then you do 3, so f of x3 minus f of x2. Two, right, and you keep going all the way down to the last one, which will be f of x n. But x n is b, and then you get uh, n minus one, right? But then we notice that hey, this f of x one cancels with that f of x one. That f of x two cancels with that f of x two. The x three is going to cancel with one there. That one, c so everything cancels except for this term and this term. And, and so what you get is you get the limit and go to infinity, right? So if you choose your C's, if you choose these carefully, the whole sum collapses down to a constant, right? And the limit of a constant is that constant. And, and so we get the answer again, f of b minus f of a. Um, so a couple different ways of seeing that this one is true. I, I think th you know, this result is important enough, it's useful enough. You're going to use it constantly in, in, for the rest of Calc 1 and for probably like the first month, maybe even two months of Calc 2. So I think it's worth two proofs. Um, it, it really is the most important result in, in your first year calculus courses. Um, so let's let's see it in action. We'll do this quickly, and then we'll uh, we'll take a little rest before we look at some more videos. Um, so the first one. So this time my 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 f of x is is x to the four. So I need an antiderivative. Antiderivative is x to the five over five, right? I don't worry about the plus c because it doesn't matter which antiderivative I use. When I plug in the endpoints, if I put that constant in, you would find that the the endpoints disappear. So what you get is that the integral from 1 to 2 of x to the 4 dx is f at 2 minus f at 1. So you get 2 to the 5 over 5 minus 1 over 5. Um, so this is 31 over 5, right? Which is dead easy. Think about trying to do that using the definition. You'd be at it forever. Um, this is simple. Um, so here's the next one, and, and let me show you the typical notation that we use here. Um, so the first thing we do is we work out the antiderivative. So 4x cubed is the derivative of x to the 4, um, and then we have 2x cubed, right? 6x squared is the derivative of 2x cubed. 8x is the derivative of 4x squared. Minus 9 is the derivative of minus 9x. And the notation we use, we put this vertical bar here to say, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to plug in the endpoints, the 0 and 3. So we get 3 to the 4 minus 2 times 3 cubed minus 4 times 3 squared minus 9 times 3. So that's the, the right endpoint minus the left endpoint, but when we plug in x equals 0, we just get 0. And if you wanted to, you could simplify all those, you know, all those numbers, but uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, you can clean it up if you are so inclined. Um, actually, it's not so bad. Um, well, let's leave it. Let's leave it at that. Um, okay. Here's one more. So cosine, of course, is the derivative of, of sine. So we get we get sine x uh, evaluated from zero to pi. So we get sine of pi minus sine of zero. Um, both of those happen to be zero. So this time the integral is actually zero. Um, that makes sense if you think about the graph. Um, we're doing this right. So this area and this area are equal but opposite sign. They cancel out and give me zero for the integral. Um, Okay, 
What about this one? Well, this is, let me write it like this. It's one half of the integral from 0 to 1 of 2x e to the x squared, right? One half cancels with that too because I can move constants in and out. Um, 2x e to the x squared happens to be the derivative of e to the x squared, and I'm evaluating from 0 to 1. So this becomes e to the 1 squared, which is e minus e to the 0, which is 1. Right? So there, there's a few examples evaluating integrals using the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And, and you know, the first two, yeah, we could, with a lot of effort, we could probably get those done using the definition. Uh, three and four, there's no way. There's no way that we could evaluate those using limits of Riemann sums. It just it's not going to happen. The only way that we can get exact values for these is by knowing the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it really is. It's a huge result for us. Um, there's an awful lot that it lets us do. Okay, we'll stop here.